how are you? Wow, I hope you are doing well. And welcome back to our Ask the Expert Series 1, Topic 3, which is our last topic uh, in this June. So guys, welcome and thank you for joining us to our Ask the Expert Series 1 and Topic 3 now. Before that, let me introduce myself first. My name is Hana. I'm Property Manager of Block 71 Jakarta. And today we are going to start the session with Gary from Fairfax Ventures and Peter from Sequoia Capital to talking about navigating the uncharted how to thrive and excel during COVID-19. And here we already uh, with Widya, our hub manager, uh, and Widya will help to moderate the session today. <laughs> All right, guys. So hello, Widya. How are you? I'm very good. How are you, Hannah? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you, Widya. All right, guys. So thank you so much once again. Please, Widya, I'll pass it to you. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So let me reintroduce myself. My name is Widya Jakarta. I'm the head manager for Innovation Factory Jakarta as well as Box and One Jakarta. So today uh, we are finished, final, finishing the last of our uh, Black Swan series discussing about COVID and also its impact on the startup world. Uh, and during the last session, we're lucky to have two very notable uh, speakers. The first one is Gary from Vertex Ventures and also Peter uh, from Sequoia Capital. So maybe to, to start this, we can have Gary and, uh, and Peter to share, share, uh, share about themselves. Maybe Gary first. <laughs> the yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Gary. I'm uh, the senior ED at Vertex Ventures. Uh, we are a global network of funds uh, headquartered in Singapore, mm -hmm. but I'm based in Jakarta actually. So we have an office mm -hmm. and a team here in Jakarta. Uh, we have offices in uh, China, Israel, uh, the US, and also India. Our fund is primarily focused on early stage companies, uh, primarily Series A. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically, that's basically pretty much it. And how about yourself, Peter? <laughs> ah, I think you're still on mute, Peter. <laughs> Classic Zoom mistake. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, my name is Peter Kems, um, um, and I work with Sequoia, Sequoia Capital. Um, Sequoia was launched in, in Silicon Valley in, in 1972 and um, got into uh, both China and, um, and India uh, about you know, 16, 17 years ago. And six, seven years ago, um, uh, opened an office in, uh, in Singapore and I joined shortly after as one of the first members of the investment team. Um, mm -hmm. We're um, investing across Southeast Asia and across seed stage uh, to, mm -hmm. to late stage. Um, and I'm currently focused very much on, on search, which is our early stage uh, seed program. Yeah. Thank you both. So I think we're quite lucky right now that um, because uh, we have two, both of you who are actively investing in the early stage startups, right? So maybe to start this discussion, maybe we can have just a brief um, overview about um, the current landscape of the startup industry uh, uh, during this COVID and post-COVID, because I think uh, the COVID uh, impacted uh, Indonesia itself in mid-March, when it's, we've had our first, um, I think early March is the first case in mid-March and we started the lockdown, and I don't, in Southeast Asia it was a bit earlier, and maybe we can have a brief uh, overview from that from your side maybe we can start with peter first yeah yeah sorry with you you're talking about an overview of uh, the landscape how has the, the startups industry has been impacted by the COVID 19 lately sure. yeah so i think it's in, in many in many things when we're looking at, at the startups mm -hmm. you have to constantly look at um mm -hmm. what is the impact that is temporary and mm -hmm. what is the impact Will stay for a longer time and and mm -hmm. maybe start with one thing i think one dynamic that had already started to change pre-covid mm -hmm. was the, the fact that for the longest time for the last few years uh mm -hmm. the startup and venture ecosystem has been an incredibly strong focus on growth and sometimes growth at all cost and so many mm -hmm. companies were um you know not necessarily be not necessarily very sustainable um in in their unit economics in how much they were burning um, but they were going very fast and, and were raising more capital 
and there was this overall belief um, uh, that um, that over time um, there uh, these companies would be able to turn around. I think on the back of uh, of, of what happened with uh, with specifically with WeWork, but with a couple of other companies that IPO'd and were not performing very well in the public markets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was starting to be a shift in a private market as well with the startups themselves, with venture investors, where the focus started to shift earlier in the, in the, in the, in the journey of the startup on, 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 on unit economics, on bottom line. And, you know, it was still okay to burn, but it needed to be more healthy. Um, mm -hmm. And then COVID hit, right? And suddenly, okay. many companies saw their top line uh, collapse, their revenue collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, their cost structure was still the same. They saw burn go up, right? And so increasingly it, was, increasingly it was important to focus on that in the early days uh, and focus much more on the, uh, the sustainable quality of the business. And so that is, I think, a fundamental shift that will, will stay longer. Um, other than that, there's obviously all sorts of changes that are more temporarily, where just companies you know, adapting very quickly to the, to the change. But I'm sure we'll get into that later. We'll have to get yeah. Gary on as well. So. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about that, Gary? Do you think uh, the fundamental shift of this, like sustainability, in, 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 is will stay? Which I do agree will stay. But like, do you think it's like a long time coming in the startup world, or is it just because of the COVID that it becomes so fast now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, the COVID uh, situation mm -hmm. is really a, a wake up call, and it caught mm -hmm. a lot of the grow at all costs uh, guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. by surprise. So I think, um, but re regardless, I think COVID did not affect just um, startups, even mm -hmm. traditional companies are also affected, uh, mm -hmm. large established companies. So I think being a startup, it's even more vulnerable. Um, I feel like uh, stuff like this could uh, and did adversely affect um, the mm -hmm. landscape. So I, I would say there will be a lot of uh, layoffs, which there was. Uh, there will be companies yeah. who might have to scale down growth uh, in order to achieve the sustainability Peter was alluding to. Mm -hmm. There may even be uh, companies that will have to close up shop because they no longer yeah. are able to pay um, the, their employees, which I hope does not affect too many people. But, you know, uh, these are extraordinary times and, and that yeah. definitely is having a bad effect. So yeah, so I think going back to being more profit oriented, uh, sustainable growth will will you know stick in people's minds uh, more so than before. Yeah, uh, how about it is it, it is in your organization? Like, uh, what was your um, I guess um, your investment thesis before this, or you uh, ha have thought, have you been focused more on the growth or? Uh, are you more focused now on the sustainability like prior to this? Yeah. No, actually, uh, from Vertex perspective, uh, mm. we, we've always been looking for companies that have solid mm. foundation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think even, even, even back when I was in my previous fund, uh, mm. when I was attending um, events and being speakers, I mean, the first things that I talk about mm -hmm. are unit economics. This was like back in 2016, probably. And, Nobody really cared back then because it was all about FOMO investments and, and you know, everybody and their uncles wanted to do a startup. But uh, I think um, at least at our fund, we've, we've always been uh, quite mindful of that uh, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I would say there, there aren't that many changes in terms of our investment thesis. We still look for uh, regional champions with strong fundamentals uh, to back. So on, on that side, it's, it's not that. Uh, it's not that different, right? Um, uh, though there are changes, obviously, when we do meet companies, we obviously ask, uh, you know, tougher questions, I guess, more, more scrutiny and more uh, just, just understanding whether the, the founders are mindful of, of sustainability and, the, and not, not just burning money for the sake of burning money. So on that side, I think there are a lot more caution, of course. Yeah. Um, so, but then these are, but how about for like early stage startups, right? Because both of you are active in early stage investing, for example, with Sequoia, with your search program, right? Um, how do you analyze that if they're making profit? Because most of the time, like tech startups early on, they won't be making many profit. And especially right now during COVID, revenue is hard and like a lot of the startups are cash trapped. So how do you analyze that in, in times of uh, pandemic like this? Maybe from Peter's side. <laughs> 
No, no, and, and listen, I think I think when mm -hmm. when, when Gary or I say that um, yeah. at, um, at the um, mm -hmm. uh, the sustainability and quality of a business, that doesn't mean that they are that mm -hmm. they're not allowed to to, to burn mm -hmm. money because mm -hmm. uh, often that is needed. But there's 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 very different levels of burning money, mm -hmm. and uh, other and that's obviously your your burn as well as the rest of your P and L are all output metrics. But you also have more scrutiny on the input metrics and what our operational mm -hmm. metrics are looking like. Uh, what is your your sales and marketing efficiency? Um, um, also, more industry like a lot of people like look just at industry size, but not at the industry structure. Like, are there even market like revenue pools and margin pools available to you as a, as, a, as a company? And so, focusing more deeply on those aspects of a business that will, in the short term as well as in the in the long term, um, decide how much margin there is to be had and what steady state gross margin, contribution margin, et cetera, could become is, is quite important. And, and many, in many instances, you won't know exactly, but you can get a directional sense. Um, and, um, and so it doesn't mean that like, everything needs to be pretty in the early days, because very often it's not. And as soon as you are, like for everyone also in this call that is involved in, in seed stage investing or, or building, they know that like, there's lots to be done and lots to be built and, and lots of imperfections, and that's okay, right? But there is a bit more scrutiny, like Gary mentioned, um, in terms of what things can become and whether there's a path towards, you know, healthy economics, not necessarily good or great, but just like healthy and acceptable versus, hey, it doesn't matter, just grow, right? Which was not necessarily the path we chose, um, but was more accepted in the market goal. Yeah. But how do you measure that in, in, in the current situation, right? Because... Um, for like what, what kind of metrics are you looking at right now if you're talking to startups who are looking for investment, especially for seed ones? Yeah. I, think, I think many of the metrics haven't changed, but how you yeah. calibrate what you think is acceptable or not, uh, how mm -hmm. much you focus on, on the underlying, mm -hmm. underlying drivers of those metrics is what matters. Mm -hmm. so you still look at the, at, at the key unit economics, you still look at mm -hmm. customer acquisition cost and LTV at the ratio, um, mm -hmm. unit economics, as mentioned, goes margin, concrete. like that's, that mm -hmm. hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, it just might be a bit stricter in terms of what you think is okay and where you think companies want to be. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about from your side, uh, Gary? Like, um, oh, I just said you agree with. Uh, <laughs> like, they have any? I was like, what do I? What do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thankfully, um, I guess uh, Peter obviously may have a, a harder job because he he's overseeing search, and these are very early stage companies. Uh, at least from Vertex, we, we invest in Series A. It's still considered early stage, but it is a stage after seed. So typically, there has been maybe six, nine, up to one year's worth of attraction that we can look at. And of course, uh, I think as, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, you know, unit economics in terms of profit contribution margin is very important to us on the first level, the second level, and also on the third level after marketing. Uh, customer acquisition cost is obviously very important as well, especially in the current environment. And you know the ratio of, of uh, the customer lifetime value to the acquisition cost, depending on what type of business that we're looking at, is obviously going to be very important. Maybe before we were we were okay with a one x. Maybe now we we we're, we tend to be more tougher and we we demand uh, you know a, a higher threshold. For example, I'm just throwing numbers out, but that's an example of calibrating on different ratios and and numbers that we look at. Oh, okay. So what about the for these founders, right? So one of one of these uh, during this time, at least from our side, as a, like an ecosystem builder right now, we see that a lot of these founders are cash trapped and they are uh, struggling and they're trying to raise funding, but at the same time, it's probably not a good time for them to raise funding. Um, what scenarios do you think could be playing out in this uh, startup uh, industry right now, like in terms of like investment or this fund uh, for early ones? Yeah. Do you think that uh, are investors still VC still investing in startups during this time, or are they holding on for right now? Yeah. Uh, who, who are you asking? Um, Gary, what uh, Gary. Are you doing? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, because you... in my screen I see Gary. This oh, is okay, a... <laughs> okay. Sorry, because I thought you switch like uh, Peter and then Gary and then Peter. <laughs> no, 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 okay. In my screen, I still see Gary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. it's all good. It's all good. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty chill. Pretty yeah. chill. Um, mm -hmm. 
So, okay. So the question was uh, whether uh, companies uh, yeah, uh, funds are still investing or not. Now, yeah. uh, fortunately, from from our side, Vertex, uh, at mm -hmm. the Southeast Asia Fund, we've just closed our fourth fund uh, in December 2019, and it was designed for uh, 2020 vintage, uh, which is this year. So, uh, it's it's about 305 million dollars. So we have uh, dry powder that that was you know committed and closed so we are always actively looking for for companies i sometimes joke with with my team that you know we're working from home usually we would have a, a chiller time you know in our lives but uh, sometimes it actually gets even more busier um, of a combination of, of reasons because uh, you know a lot of companies are also looking for for funding you know a lot of people are also in trouble so at least from from our side you know, uh, we, we do believe that there, there will be companies out there that just maybe, you know, unlucky or just bad timing have a cash flow with a uh, problem with cash flow, but actually fundamentally are, are driven by a strong team or a strong uh, market thesis. So mm -hmm. and those companies we, we would like to, to uh, look into as well to, to look for, right? Uh, not strictly bargain hunting, but, you know, identifying among the people who are having, uh, a trouble but essentially fundamentally great we would like to also back so 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 yeah we at least from our side we're still very active um and from your side peter yeah same, same here we, we we just closed another term sheet i saw just literally 20 minutes before we started this and oh congrats <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's been a lot of uh, of, of uh, new investment both both in in search uh, as well as in Sequoia, including some some growth announcement. Uh, there was an announcement, um, uh, I think, last week about Tonic, uh, an investment in um, uh, in, in Philippines, uh, and there's you know a couple more announcement following. There was also an announcement uh, yesterday about an investment uh, Sequoia did in um, in Horizon, which is a quantum computing uh, company. Yeah, I saw that. Congrats, where, man. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, where I was personally quite involved. Um, nice. I think we we closed. Uh, Equitable AI earlier this year, which is a health tech. So there's lots of activity still going on, um, and um, uh, and again that that hasn't changed uh, from from an activity uh, level point of view. I think for the startups themselves, you know, as Gary was mentioning, some of them are getting cash trapped, and and it's been quite challenging. I think what we've seen is um, um, you know looking back at different different market cycles, like some of the best companies also like globally in Sequoia's portfolio guys like Stripe and Airbnb and Dropbox and several of them were in the, you know, 2007, eight, nine type of, you know, cycle around um, uh, the previous market, uh, market crash. And, and so we see very strong companies often being founded in, in tough times. Um, and, um, and there's something to say for that, right? They, they, they actually like the, the, the guys in search right now, we're talking about that. Many of them we've, we've never met in person uh, as a group. We've never met in person, but we're, meet, we're meeting once, twice a week on, on Zoom. Uh, every Thursday for a full day. Um, and so you, you forge a community despite not seeing each other. You have to drive sales in a climate where people are reluctant to buy and where budgets are frozen. If you can conquer that in the early days, like you've been you know, forced by, you know, by, by in, in, in an environment of, of, of adversity, right? And so that often creates very, uh, very strong startups. I think the other thing that we're seeing in the portfolio, and, and, and again, um, you know, Obviously, some companies are struggling, but we've also seen some amazing examples of companies turning around and companies that, are, that find ways to cut burn, that find ways to improve economics, um, that, that find ways to increase revenue despite lower demand, et cetera. And, and then where the expectations are that when COVID turns around, you know, those shifts, they, they, they bring with them that the lean, the lean structure of the company, the improved economics, some of them will actually... Uh, might not sustain, but many of them will sustain, and so many of them will come out stronger, right? So, there's, you know, every every cloud has a silver lining, so to speak. Yeah, that is very true. Though. A lot of the uh, the larger, like the, took telco startups uh, the, do got fortune during adversity like time like this. But, um, so this is 2020. What about like 2021? Like, what about the year after this? Do you think it will change, or uh, the investment will still continue? To grow yeah promise uh, i'm just gonna use Peter. I think 2019, no one no one knew what 2020 was gonna look like <laughs> and, and so I, I don't think that uh mm -hmm. that, you know mm -hmm. that 
unless Gary has a crystal ball, I don't, I don't have one. So I don't know what it's going to look like. One of the things that, 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 we, that we have looked at again, and I think this is true for both Vertex and, and Sequoia, if you look at the, at the number of funds in, in Singapore, um, uh, you know, they've been around, you know, in, in Singapore, obviously even longer than us, but in terms of like overall, like you've seen multiple cycles and, and like what, what we've sometimes seen is that suddenly you start, there's a, there's a, a frothy market and suddenly many folks start investing more like over, you know, 40 plus year, we've seen that no year is necessarily better than others. So if you invest more and your pace of investment goes up, it actually implies that you're lowering your bar because the, the supply of good startups is not suddenly going up massively. And so what we often tell ourselves is that whether it's a good time or a bad time, you have to maintain a certain stability in terms of investment pace. You shouldn't have a situation where, hey, there's, a, there's market setbacks or, or broader setbacks like right now and suddenly you stop investing. And likewise, when we come out, we shouldn't suddenly be crazy in terms of investing much more. Because again, the supply of good startups you know, tends to be somewhat, you know, it, it evens out. So you have to manage for pace. And I, I don't think 2020 um, is going to be suddenly a lot more, like it's going to be easier, hopefully, when you get to meet people again. And, uh, and valuations will, will, will swing back and forth. But, you know, we're trying to, to uh, hold ourselves to a certain bar and we're, we're trying to stabilize pace overall always and that won't change. Yeah. Well, what about from your side, Gary? Do you have a crystal ball, as uh, Peter said? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. Uh, we can always make our, our best guess, but uh, I, I, we, we can't really predict what's going on. I guess, um, you know, I echo what, what uh, Peter said. You know, I think the, the, the sentiment here at Vertex is also, um, you know, some, some of the best companies will, will come out from the toughest uh, time. So we look forward to identifying those opportunities to invest. Now, with regards to 2020 or 2021, uh, I guess, you know, I can just comment from a macro level. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, this COVID situation is not necessarily 100% uh, gone, right? It, despite the fact that we have uh, removed Bias Bebe. Uh, I think as long as there hasn't been a, a vaccine yet, there there is a, a chance that there could be a certain, uh, you know, maybe a second wave. Uh, we know for sure that the majority of the human populations are still not uh, immune to it yet, right? So the question is whether this will prolong enough to hurt, uh, you know, global economies across the, the, the world and thus setting off a chain of events that that will be just bad. Um, who knows? I mean, th that is obviously a possibility. So we do advise our portfolios to to always maintain their their cash flow and ensure that they can survive through at least 2021. Now, obviously, there are in news um, uh, talking about potentially creating a, a vaccine by early 2021 or end of 2020. And I think that would help everybody immensely, regardless of the situation, because you know, if, if, if more people can be immune to it, then we, we really don't need to worry too much about these anymore. So uh, until that happens, I think the overall stance, uh, even from uh, investment and also portfolio management perspective, is to, to still be mindful and be conservative and, and be cautious. Um, uh, and, and, but at the same time, uh, you know, continue to look for bullish opportunities in the sector so. and then um what is your advice for the startups right now for example those in your existing portfolio or those who are like uh because right now everybody is in a kind of um just um wait and see kind of figure out like every month every week what's going on in the involvement especially like with the easing of the lockdown and going or the lockdown and stuff like that what do you yeah, think yeah yeah good advice for Sarah founder right now right? yeah of course because uh, you know the, the lockdown and the, mm -hmm. the liftoff and hopefully continued liftoff of lockdown mm -hmm. will affect people doing sales right mm -hmm. uh, especially for like for I'm just like an example like a b2b company uh, typically the sales cycle is longer it's not like just advertising on on Instagram or Google <clears throat> so they need to meet companies and if they aren't able to then really they cannot generate too much business now so mm -hmm. In, in that case, you know, then you got to maintain your cash flow, make sure you don't 
you know, spend uh, too much cash on a monthly basis that, that you run out of money, right? So are you going to make sure that you survive? And, and uh, until, until that period of time where you think things may be better, in this case, let's say 2021, then you just got to make sure that the money in the bank versus the monthly burn that you're doing will cover how many months it takes for you to reach 2021. And then by that time, if things are looking better, then you can start going out there, do some sales, make some business, right? So I think uh, in terms of just basic survivability, uh, that is always going to be very important for, for any company really uh, at this stage. Yeah, I, I, I second that. And, and I think, you know, we've seen many companies much more actively managing their, their runway and managing their burn. And um, I saw a question from, from Felix with regards to like extra funds. And I don't think necessarily extra funds, but when, at least you know, speaking for ourselves, when you see a company that has been executing well and it is trending nicely, but it suddenly hit and, and runs into trouble on the back of that, we have been extra supportive. We have from a follow on funding, um, mm -hmm. we, we have followed on, make sure that extra funds were available to companies that, that needed it to sustain throughout this period. And we've been more flexible there. And we've also um, tried to, to do that at, at very favorable terms so that we don't, like, you can't punish a founder for COVID, right? It's not, it's not fair, so to speak. And so um, that we've tried to do. Um, and, and many founders, even regardless of that, have started to take a different approach. And some folks were trying to raise large rounds, for example, and said, hey, you know what? Um, that might not be the right time for that. Let's, let's make sure that we manage indeed for getting towards the end of 2021 to so get like at least 18 months or more of runway um and you know that's been important and that's been the focus yeah i think those are one of the key things that i've uh, understood from all this series of like the things to maintain is like maintain your runway but then at the same time there are just those startups who are just like because during this COVID thing i think there are those who are like benefit greatly for example for like audio conferencing and all that but there are those who are like <laughs> who are just unlucky for like, um, for example, like the travel industry and also for those who are like more like FNB, like what do you think are your advice for those who are like negatively impacted during this COVID? Because as you say, like maintain your runways, but like maintain your runways might be easier. But if you have like, if you're, if you're one of the negatively impacted one, what do you think is a good um, strategy for them right now? <laughs> Uh, maybe from you, Gary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So, uh, so I was <laughs> I was just looking at at this question. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I I know Felix as well, and, and uh, he's complaining that I don't, I'm not answering his questions. <laughs> <laughs> so Felix, <laughs> to answer your question, to follow on on uh, Peter's uh, answer is that uh, yeah, of course, uh, for for high performing uh, yeah. portfolios, we look for. Uh, we look to to continue to support them, and of course, we have done them uh, through either a bridge or a proper uh, fundraising situation. So, so we will do extra funding for ex, um, existing portfolios. Now, of course, the ones who are not doing very well, uh, there will be extra thinking that that goes along with it. Now, uh, sorry, would you mind repeating your question? Uh, not so worry. I know sorry. Felix as well. He's busy. <laughs> 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 So yeah, basically, um, one of the key thing right now that a lot of like investors are saying to their portfolio or to startups when they're asking for advice, like maintain your runways, right? For like the mm. next 12 months, make sure you have enough cash. But at the same time, there are those who are negatively impacted who, who just can't maintain your runway. For example, like those in the, in the travel, uh, yeah. my mom say, travel and also yeah. the FNB industry. What do you think is a good strategy right, for, for these founders right now? Yeah, so I guess uh, there, there are several ways they can do. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, again, as I said, it could be bad timing or just being unlucky. For example, you just did a, a big capital expenditure and now you're stuck in, in a COVID situation with very minimal cash. Now, you have a good relationship with your investors. Of course, uh, you can talk about potential bridging uh, a month just, just, just to survive, you know, for the next um, six, eight, 12 months. Uh, or it could be a proper uh, fundraising cycle, which is obviously going to be really tough, but you may be able to pull it off with your internal investors. Now, on the uglier side, uh, and a lot of people may not want to talk about this, um, but you have been seeing on the news a lot, is to, to downsize. So uh, you, you may not be able to maintain your, your cash outflow 
given your current operations. Uh, so it is highly advisable in, in such situations that you, you, you just may have to, you know, uh, you know, take, take the hit, right? Um, uh, downsize either, uh, what do you call it, unpaid leave or potentially really just letting go of some people. Uh, it's, it's a hard truth, but sometimes necessary. Uh, and, you know, they, and a lot of people in which you've seen in the news, read the news probably, have done it. Uh, for exactly that reason. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Peter? Like, what kind of uh, advice or strategy do you have for these founders who are struggling right now? No, I think a few things. Like, one, I think, is, is focus. And you see, you know, normally out of the 10 projects, you would prioritize five, and now you prioritize two, right? You delay stuff. You focus on the core business. Lots of, lots of, of larger companies that were already larger and had multiple lines of business have focused, have stopped some lines of business or have delayed or stopped moving into a new country. So I think focus on, on the core um, is, is, is a big thing. Uh, focusing on the fundamentals uh, is, is a big thing. Um, and, and in a positive way, we are often surprised by the elasticity of, of a company as a system. And there's been just companies where even the founders like four months ago would have said it's, it's impossible to, you know, shed 20% of the workforce and still grow and they managed to do it. And uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just unbelievable how, how suddenly things are possible. Like sometimes you wonder like, why did you burn so much? Or why did you fund so much? Because like this, clearly this was possible, right? And, and it, takes, it takes a crisis like COVID to bring that out. Um, but, um, and, and so like the saying of never waste a good crisis is, uh, is, is uh, holding true in many of these instances, right? Which is, but we've, we've been positively surprised in, in many cases by, by just you know, managing much stricter, raising the bar on many different aspects of the business. Yeah, yeah that, that is so true. <laughs> Very surprising, mm -hmm. but it's so true. Yeah, I guess the other thing I could add is uh, also entertain the possibility of, uh, of a slight pivot. You know, you may be doing a certain business a certain way, sell a certain SKU. Now uh, you may have to to go where the market goes, you know, uh, and and adjust the the types of SKUs that you're selling, the services that you're selling, uh, change the features in your software that you're that you're peddling. So those are the things that that you can do, and obviously you need to be very agile while doing this, and and and, and you know uh, make sure that the that the adjusted product fits the current market. And that way you can continue to 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 make business right, like. Look, COVID obviously, as I say, is a wake up call, is a game changer, but you know, there's still billions of people alive out here uh, trying to live and trying to, trying to make a living, right? So it doesn't mean that business is dead. For example, uh, food delivery probably skyrocketed, right, in COVID. So there, there are a lot of things that, that you could just look at and not, you know, like I guess look outwards outside your company, look for opportunities. Uh, ways to disrupt new ways to disrupt obviously given the situation and 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 grow from there you know and stop looking inside and say like oh man i'm so unlucky i got hit by covid there's nothing i can do about it so i, I guess i guess to a certain extent yeah i mean like there will be founders out there that are uh, quite motivated passionate and, and actually intelligent enough to, to identify these pockets of opportunities yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's very very true and, and maybe to build on that like like our, our U.S. team was one of the first, in at least definitely in, in the in the U.S. where where COVID obviously hit later, to um to basically uh, ring the alarm bell and uh, I think on March first, uh, release an, an article that went pretty viral at least in, in the U.S. startup scene, um, around COVID being a black swan event. And one one of the things they said there is basically question everything, question your runway, question your burn, question your funding strategy but also question what product you offer to what market in some cases, right? And so, you know, in some cases you, you could not change either the product or the market. So if you, you, you would continue to offer the same product to the same market. And the only thing you could do is change things in the core. But you've also seen companies that said, hey, what, like, what happens if we, you know, go for the same market, but we, we change our product. And like one example is in, in, um, in Search right now, there's a company in Indonesia called CoLearn. And uh, they were learning, uh, a learning education company uh, but, but focus on offline centers. And they've obviously pivoted their offering to be completely online. And post-COVID, they will be going for an, for, an, for, an, um, uh, for an online model as well. And then we've seen companies that um, uh, 
basically uh, have the same product, for example, we've seen some food delivery companies that were more B2B in Singapore, but suddenly started going after different customers because there was so much B2C demand and they could actually dampen some of the, um, the reduced demand from their B2B customers by, by going for B2C customers. Um, and so questioning everything and, and flexibly moving to adjacencies either in different products or in different markets, um, you know, some companies have, have been very nimble in, in how they've done that. Yeah, but can I also, do you think this pivoted or this like new business model, how sustainable are they after this? Like for example, if uh, will they be sustainable after, for example, the COVID, let's say it lasts for the next, I don't know, 12 months or whatever it is, like will this business model be sustainable or should they also still focus on their core? Business, no, I think, right? At least for the examples that, that I mentioned, I know uh -huh. one thing will, will, will move back to that core business. Uh -huh. uh, learn will continue to 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 be uh -huh. the, um, uh, to be online focused. When it comes to food delivery, there was an interesting research being done, I think, by Facebook that said that like more on on groceries actually, but uh, forty three percent of people during COVID have spent significantly more on on uh, online groceries. But 85% of those, or 83% of those, will continue to do so post-COVID, right? So sometimes it's it's not a, a sudden blip and then it goes back to normal, but it's a sudden rush, and, and after that it will maintain at a much higher level than before. And and so you know, whenever we look at investments now, it's constantly looking at okay, like that abnormality for the last three months and maybe the next two, like will that be completely gone afterwards, either good or bad, or a bit, or it completely has changed the trajectory of a company. And it's not often easy to foretell, obviously. Again, no crystal ball. <laughs> I wish we all had a crystal ball, but I think it's the way that I think. Uh, how about from your side, Gary? Do you have an example maybe from your portfolio or maybe from your other teammates of those company who are struggling and have pivoted as well? Yeah, uh, again, it's not a hard pivot, right? It's and more about uh, mm -hmm. certain um, uh, changes in, in the, the makeup of the product that they're selling. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, Warung Pintar, they, they primarily sell FMCG products, uh, but now because of the COVID environment, there are, there are a lot more demand on basic needs like sambako, you know, so, so they're looking to supply uh, their channel, distribution channel with, with more like, you know, flour, sugar, and all that stuff. So it's, it's adjusting to, to what the market needs uh, in terms of, of, of uh, what, what, what the demand, where the demand is, right? Another company is uh, Gredu, for example. Uh, they sell software to schools. Now that schools are uh, being shut down and there's a lot of learning from home, they need to tweak the software a little bit to actually enable and facilitate a teacher-student uh, relationship and communication, right? Because it's not like school suddenly, you, you stop learning uh, as a kid. Uh, you, you're just learning from home. You know what I mean? So there are certain tweaks on the, on the software that needed to be done on that. So I think uh, there are a lot of things that, that companies can do. And uh, as an entrepreneur, it's, 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 I mean, you know your company best and most. So you should be able to look at what you're capable of, what your team is capable of, and, and whether this, where, where the situation is going to and adjust accordingly. I mean, the fact that you're, you're an entrepreneur defines your adaptability you know, it doesn't matter. Like, let's say things do go, get well in, by the end of 2020 and you want to, to beef up your uh, core business and you want to revert to what you're doing, then do it because that's obviously the right answer. And as an entrepreneur, you're able to see that in your vision. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe it's a, a, what you used to do plus uh, the new thing that you had to do uh, in this situation, right? So it's, it's all fluid. There's no... There's no uh, yes, you have to do this. Now you have to stop. Now you got to pivot back, pivot right. I mean, it's, it's all it's all like liquid, right? You're you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you're you're mm -hmm. adaptable. So yeah. yeah. So maybe this is a follow-on question from Philip Gozali, who is uh, within the Q and A. So he's basically his business is a focus on security hardware, um, and he started pivots on creating and selling health through hydrogen-related products. Uh, he said, like, does it make sense? Well, it's like a brand image, but it's, I guess this is more of a question, like, is, does it make sense for him to pivot heavily to this uh, health and hygiene related product? Um, maybe just a little feedback from you guys. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe. I, I think in, in, in general, 
with, with only so little information, it's, it's hard to yeah. know what in the long run mm -hmm. that is, if that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know the before state, I won't know the after. So that's, mm -hmm. that's hard to ask. In general though, um, you know, some people say like 2020, you, you can almost throw it away. Whatever happened in 2020, like, like mm -hmm. companies suddenly burning more or suddenly growing mm -hmm. less, or suddenly growing more or alcohol companies that are suddenly selling uh, hand sanitizer. Like there's so much change then people can basically, whatever has happened, can say, yeah, it was COVID. So it was different. So it's almost like normally it impacts the trajectory of your company. You look at the history. Why did you make certain choices? Here, very often, there was no choice that you could make, right? It was such force majeure that there was little you mm -hmm. could do. So people will cut you a lot of slack in terms of whatever decision you've made, right? Um, you know, some people in a portfolio are worried that people would, would react weirdly if they would fire people. At some stage, we said, like, people would, would react weirdly if you haven't fired people, right? You didn't make the right call. And, and so things are, are, are very different. And so I don't think in the long run, uh, Philip, it will change your brand image if suddenly you did other stuff. Um, if you decide to stick with that new direction, then the question is like, hey, does that make sense? And will demand you know, sustain? And, and that's, that's a broader discussion that's hard to answer here. But in general, doing a temporary thing during COVID, I think no one will hold it against you in the long run. Yeah. Uh, what about from your side, Gary? Because you were talking about like uh, your, your couple of square pivoted and going back to your main. Uh, right. Okay. So uh, same same question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, Peter. Obviously, again, um, mm -hmm. if it's verbatim as of what was written there, yeah. uh, in general, uh, people would cut you some slack. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, when I mm -hmm. said a pivot, it's not not like a ninety degree pivot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that said, uh, if you are looking to do a 90 degree pivot, I mean, 180 degree pivot, which is what the uh, question seems to be alluding, then it could obviously affect the brand image. A, a brand stands for something, right? A brand stands for a value, uh, an identity that you're trying to communicate with the customer. So if you are, okay, this is a stupid example, but it's an extreme example. Let's say, you are selling food ingredients and now, oh, sorry, you're selling like uh, pesticides. And now because there's a lot more cloud kitchens and food delivery, you want to start selling uh, food ingredients, right? And your brand is obviously known for selling pesticides. People will be like, you know, what's going on? Why is this guy like trying to sell me food ingredients when he's obviously selling like poison, right? So I think, I, I mean, that's a very extreme example, but you got to use common sense to a certain extent, right? And I think for the most part in general, like if, if you're tweaking certain things, if you're going into an adjacent uh, sector that you are able to serve with your current capabilities, I think people will be okay with that, as Peter said. So, so I think, I think it's, it's fine, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, from our side as well, we see a lot of our uh, startups either Unfortunately, there are them who just uh, have to shut down, <laughs> but there are those who do, who does like a pivot to see if they can last uh, for for the for the time being right now. Um, maybe it's, we can continue on to see to discuss a bit. Like, what do you think is there is a word that's been thrown around here? I don't know how it is uh, everywhere else, but in Indonesia, there is the word like new normal, right? So. What do you think is uh, you see is uh, the new normal? What 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 is your prediction will be like the new normal? Like what is the change in the consumer behavior and of like what is uh, the optimistic and pessimistic uh, opinion from your side as well in terms of like consumer behavior also for this uh, current uh, industry? Yeah. Yeah, so. I think again it will, it will change a lot depending on on the industry, but overall. Mm -hmm. um, like we think about this concept of like net new digital behaviors, right? There's mm -hmm. certain behaviors that are augmented. Like Sequoia mm -hmm. is fortunate to be an investor in, or is fortunate to be an investor in Zoom, and, and obviously that has gone through. Um, and um, and, uh, and and so it's just more of that. But some of the challenges that Zoom has had also is that it was suddenly being used for things that it wasn't being used for, and suddenly what it went from B to B to being a household brand, right? Like my mm -hmm. my daughter of six of six years old talks about Zooming and my, my mom of 74 talks about Zooming and everyone is Zooming, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, not necessarily new behavior, but like accelerated and, and often augmented with other stuff. Like 
you know, I see my, my kids do Kahoot uh, games and we've done it even in our office uh, on, on Zoom calls. You see uh, Sequoia was also an investor at, in, in, in House Party, which is, uh, and, 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 uh, which is very yeah. much in the US. Uh, it, it has been acquired since, but, uh, but interesting. Companies like Clubhouse. So you're seeing a lot on, on that. Um, and, and not just in a B2B environment, right? We, we, we've had parties with, with founders, with like 150 founders on there. And it was the live band. And the live band was playing somewhere in Asia. I don't even know why. We kept it secret just for fun. But they were playing in front of a camera and that was on Zoom. And we were looking into the, into the living rooms of people all over Asia, like dancing in the living rooms in a, in a, in a, like a Zoom party, which is weird, right? And so there's all these newer behaviors um, that, um, and some of them will, will definitely stick around. And whether it's learning or partying or social or weddings or funerals, like all these things are happening remote. So this concept of the low touch society, uh, like it's changing behaviors, it's also changing technologies. We see a lot of, of, uh, of um, focus on, on robotic process automation in software or actually robotics, physical robotics elsewhere where you know, people are just trying to see what more they can do without people, without physical touch, et cetera. And so that's driving a huge uh, embrace of technology. And I think any company in, in enterprise software and automation, uh, like right now it's a bit struggling because some budgets are frozen still and people are still a bit scared. Um, but as soon as they come out of that, the likelihood of, of, of things uh, quickly growing very fast is, uh, is quite a high likelihood. Yeah. Is this true that like um, suddenly everybody knows how to Zoom? It's just quite crazy. Like for example, for us, uh, we used to do this event offline. I think Peter was a speaker in one of our events previously. We used to have like a big event and then we just changed suddenly to online. And it's an interesting as well because then we have access to a larger uh, network, right? A larger market that we've never had access to before. For example, I know there's somebody from Taiwan who would not have been able to and join like a webinar like this. So what about you, Gary? What do you think about this term of the new normal? Like what do you think would happen in this? Yeah, I, my, my personal opinion is I feel like uh, it's still very early uh, right now and things are still in flux. So I, I, I can't really say, you know, what the standard of living will be for the majority of humankind in the next, you know, six to 12 months. But I do notice, and of course, uh, in, in agreement with, with a lot of what other people have said, is the, the more, uh, I guess, familiarity of, of people interacting with technology and the utilization of technology to better and improve certain uh, people's lives, of course, right? Again, um, I, I guess just, just from the Indonesian perspective, uh, again, uh, when, when, uh, people are are looking to purchase certain things now they're more likely to to purchase from online whereas you know we might have gone through this process regardless but these things just accelerated as as peter mentioned so i think that's a good thing for for our business at least as a venture capitalist because we do focus on companies and startups that that look to utilize technology uh, to you know, disrupt existing uh, industries or, or or make it easier for for people to 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 enjoy certain things. So, so I, I see that as a positive thing. Uh, yeah. So I think that would be my my, my view yeah. on this. Yeah. So maybe I think we're closing in as well to our uh, our discussion. Um, I think P Peter is also having a discussion in the chat with Manuel right now. <laughs> so maybe just to close this, um, who do you think are the like the winner of this COVID, right? For example, I know that Zoom, like other kinds of things, is one, but like, do you think that these um, businesses that uh, profits now during COVID will continue to grow and continue to lose, succeed after this? Or do you think it will just like a temporary success? And what do you think are the criteria for this to maintain their um, success during time like this? Yeah. Maybe Peter? <laughs> yeah, sure. Listen, I think, I think. Yeah. Everything that is that is high touch and that is and that is offline and that is retail uh, offline retail is struggling, uh, but anything that is e-commerce has grown through the roof. Like Amazon has has hit its highest, uh, share price I think earlier this week. If I'm not wrong, um, guys like 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 um, like PayPal on May 1st was their largest ever day of payments, uh, bigger than any any um, uh, any Black Friday or Cyber Monday. And they were signing up 250,000 uh, new accounts every day. Uh, even traditional online guys in the U.S. like Target 
that has actually doubled down a lot on, on their uh, on their e-commerce aspects, um, you know, has seen like an amazing growth and 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 like. 300% month over month. So everything that is e-commerce, that is payments, Stripe is through the roof, all these things has, have grown a lot and, and uh, we'll see more of that positive dynamic. And then on the B2B side, as I mentioned earlier, I think any, any enterprise software that is focused on, on productivity, on AI, on automation, uh, et cetera, will continue to see uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of demand uh, and that will continue. Um, so, yeah, those things won't go away suddenly. They, they might go off their, their COVID peak, but they will continue at a, at a, at a, at a very nice pace. Yeah. What well, about do you think, Gary? Who do you think? Yeah. Are the, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with Peter, what uh, Peter said. I think there are a lot of uh, publications out there. I just saw like a Tech in Asia article the other day talking about kind of like sectors uh, and they will benefit uh, from this. So mm -hmm. I, I would suggest for, for uh, you know, entrepreneurs to, to obviously you know, still still be on the lookout, obviously reading all the source news materials that are out there and always, uh, always, uh, you know, have have a have a consideration of all these new things that, that might happen. Now, certain things may may not be applicable to Indonesia, um, for example, things that are too deep tech or so. Uh, but again, uh, you know, e-commerce obviously benefiting uh, food deliveries benefiting cloud kitchen potentially could be benefiting so uh, education technology could be uh, benefiting so so these are the things that that uh, I guess you just need to keep your uh, to be on your toes and, and keep a lookout yeah and do you have like uh, advice for those who are actually not benefiting like for example those who are in the travel industry I know we discussed it a bit early on but maybe you have any additional uh, yeah, again, I think, I feel like, again, it's, uh, look, this is not going to be forever, right? Yeah. Again, uh, people are, people are going to go on planes again. People are going to go on vacation. It's not like suddenly nobody's going to go on vacation anymore for the rest of their lives, right? So on that side, on your core business, then, yeah, uh, set aside, um, what do you call it, yeah, uh, provisions to, to make sure that you still exist uh, by the time that time uh, comes back, um, and, and people will, will be able to resume uh, what they want to do, right? Uh, uh, but at the same time, like if, if, if there are other opportunities that you identify you can do on, a, on an adjacent, uh, no, again, I don't like to use the word pivot, but for lack of a better word, uh, pivot, you know, and, and adjust and make sure that you still make business and, and not just dry up and die completely. So I think that would be, I guess, the, the main thing. I mean, it is a bit vague, it's a bit high level, but. Unfortunately, because each each company is, will will need to be able to deal with their situation very differently. A B two C company will be very different than a B two B company, and each sector is going to be very different. But I think the overarching theme would be what what I just alluded to. Yeah. How about you, Peter? What would be your advice for those to, for startups who are like uh, negatively impacted by this at times? Yeah. yeah, it's in line with what we talked about earlier, right? Like for yeah. Important, but also mm -hmm. embrace the adjacencies, right? Whether mm -hmm. like if you're travel right now, like mm -hmm. what should you be doing? What could you be doing? And, and can you go for different markets or different customer segments? Or, or is there other value that you can provide? It's very easy for me to say when you're in a travel company right now, it's super hard. And like sometimes it requires lots of empathy, I think, from everyone around them, you know, investors, workers, etc. cetera. And, and, and the same is true for some of the companies that, that are involved in offline retail and some of them are in our portfolio as well. And so it's, it's very easy to say these things and it's very hard and, and, and sometimes heartbreaking, frankly, for, for the companies and, and, and what they're going through. Um, but as Gary mentioned, this thing, this too will pass. And so hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, I think I am on time. I'm quite bored. Like, uh, so I think uh, we can close today's discussion. Um, maybe, uh, do you have anything else to add from your side? Or? <laughs> Uh, no, no, obviously there are these questions that are unanswered, so I don't know, should oh. we just not? Uh... Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so maybe we can answer. There's the first one maybe from E1. Um, uh, it's very specific. Uh, is there still some space for seed funding in hardware green tech, especially in the transport and EV sector, or are funds reserved for the cash flow? So this is a very specific uh, question maybe for... Uh, for you, Gary. 
again, I, I, we don't really do seed funding. Uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if Peter can comment on this from mm -hmm. a research perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I guess it, it, it really depends on, on again, I, I, can't, I can't really say without knowing a bit more. Uh, but of course, again, uh, fundings are not just for reserving cash flow. Obviously, if there are companies that could thrive in this situation, then you could use the funds to, to actually grow, right? Because obviously it's, you're thriving and you're able to have a sustainable unit economics. So it doesn't mean that you should not do anything and not grow, right? So, so I hope that message doesn't get uh, misconstrued. Yeah. What about you uh, from your perspective here, especially with your search program, right? Again, there, there, it's not necessarily a cash flow thing. You'd look at you'd, you'd, you'd always look at different businesses in different ways, and I think um, um, oftentimes hardware is seen as something that is that is quite difficult, regardless of COVID or, or non COVID. Um, and um, you know, as soon as you start talking about things again that are that are offline and that are transportation, etc., like those have all suffered a lot, right? If, if people can't go out to a restaurant or to a shop, like they don't need transport as much. Right? I I ordered my my first Gojek. Uh, earlier in the week and I was literally like, you know, where, where's the app again? Because I'd literally not used it for like two and a half months. And so it is obviously a sector where it's very hard to show early traction and, and it's, it's generally a tough one, uh, but even more so now. So it has less to do with preserving cash as well as, hey, what are the sectors that, that you know, might take time to, to get out of this? And, uh, and so market timing is, is, is always crucial and that's, that's the truth here as well. So, uh, so I hope that answers your question, Ewan. And the last question from Manuel. So both Gary and Peter are agreeing in the landscape of startups. Uh, is there anything you believe you disagree on or, or, or might be controvers controversial on this topic? Yeah, let's do uh, okay. 100 topics and see which one we disagree on. <laughs> <laughs> why, why didn't you suggest something? Uh, exactly. I wasn't sure. I guess uh, what is it that, that is controversial? Yeah. Um, Emmanuel, do you have anything to ask you that? I'm, I'm, I'm looking through my questions now. Why, yeah. yeah. Is he even still it, here? Um, I think he's still here. Okay. Um, wait. Oh, is he still there? Yeah, no. I think he's still here. Uh-huh. Uh, landscape of startup. Can we anything that disagree? Controversial. What would be controversial? I think the most controversial thing I can think of would be letting go mm -hmm. people, because mm -hmm. that's always a sensitive issue. But I, I feel like I think, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't even have to be me and Peter. You know, I think majority mm -hmm. of people would would agree that uh, that is a necessary evil sometimes. So yeah, hiring or firing people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you agree what? on hiring or hiring? Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. I, again, yeah. I think uh, I think uh, firing is obviously sensitive, but but sometimes necessary. Hiring is also okay. Again, as I said, a company that's thriving uh, mm -hmm. definitely have an opportunity to to hire more people. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's even not one or the other. Like, like I've seen companies that actually take these up, they, they see it almost as an opportunity to streamline, but also because they focus mm -hmm. their business model, they say, hey, we're going to streamline. By the way, that means we're going to get rid of this department or this country or whatever, and they fire. But at the same time, they say, hey, we're doubling down on the core, so we want more engineers there or whatever, right? So they might, you know, they might fire 40 people, but hire 10 people in a different area or with different skill sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, our, our portfolio, like Tani and, and Happy Fresh, they're doing so well over the COVID era that, you know, sometimes they get overwhelmed and people are unable to order or, or, or get fulfilled. They had to hire more people. So, I, I, again, it really depends, right? And as an entrepreneur, you just have to see. I mean, if you're not doing very well and you need to survive, you got to make that logical conclusion that, yeah, okay, I got to let go some people. But you know what? It, it, okay, the other thing I have... Uh, uh, said to my portfolio is that it doesn't necessarily have to be firing, right? I mean, if again, firing is kind of like uh, what? Yeah, uh, once once you let go people, then they 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 either hate you for it or you you burn that bridge. So the other way you can do is you know unpaid leave. I think I think or or a reduced cut, right? Uh, reduced pay. I mean, sorry. So uh, people are generally 
uh, understanding, especially if you have a good relationship with your with your employee and they believe in what you're trying to do, you know, and they may be willing to 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 take a hit, take one for the team, you know, for a month or so. Right. So there there are creative ways you can go about this. Yeah, and I've seen companies do that where they actually said, and it's actually you know some some investors in the board were frowning on the fact that they that, that they weren't firing people, and they said like this: if I fire people now it will hit me much harder because of severance. So it hits my cash flow, which is the most important thing I need to watch out for. And so it's better to actually have people on like, for example, uh, take mandatory pay cuts or, or have unpaid leave, uh, et cetera, that doesn't hit them as hard, right? Um, so I, I think that's true. Um, I think like Manuel really wants us to disagree on stuff. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I just I just responded. <laughs> if you can suggest some topic uh, that, that you have in mind. It's yeah. actually, actually interesting how often we actually do agree with, with other investors because they, they, they often take a somewhat similar lens. And yes, there might be nuances where your firm has a different view, but in yeah. many situations I've actually been surprised with how well aligned as a board, we are with other investors. And I think both Vertex and ourselves are, you know, in a certain type of VC as well. Obviously, there's all sorts of differences as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if it would be, you know, Gary and someone who runs a crypto fund, uh, <laughs> me and someone who runs, like, more, like, controversial points. But here, I think broadly, we're, we're, we're broadly aligned on many of them. Yeah. Yeah, I guess unfortunately for you, Manuel. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, but I, I the, the whole thing about hiring and firing people, like for us personally, we've seen startups who are like, who just entered our space a couple months ago, but then unfortunately they do FNB Cloud Kitchen and then they had to close. And yeah. like, when then this, it happens. And I think one of the things that I think what they did was that they are very clear with the communication through the firing process. Also, they are also asking us for help to look them for a job and also like supporting them, even though like they explain to their um, employees that it's not because of their bad employees or they're not good. It's just unlucky, right? So maybe this is the last question uh, for this session uh, from an anonymous. Anonymous. Oh, I can't pronounce that word. Sorry. Uh, uh, how does company that affected by COVID nineteen, example Airbnb, would survive this situation? What strategies they should be do to survive? I think we've uh, yeah. uh, touched upon this a couple of times, right? So maybe. Yeah. Uh, so one of them is that. Um, if you can add <laughs> that, uh, Gary or Peter. Yeah, I think we covered that a few times. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if I have much to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, okay. same. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Anonymous, if you want to ask, you can rewatch this in SFB as well. I think we covered mm -hmm. that. Okay. Anyway, uh, I think that is all for today. Uh, so I would like to thank you both for today's, uh, for your time today. I definitely learned a lot. I. I'm afraid that we couldn't give Manuel the fight that he wants during this talk. <laughs> <laughs> but but definitely it, it was good to close this session about the blockchain series and I'm sure it is been beneficial for all of the startups as well to uh, everybody who attends and uh, maybe I will pass it back to Hana uh, to close the session yeah wow yeah. all right thank you so much guys Peter Gary and Widya it was an insightful session <laughs> okay so yeah guys uh, thank you for joining uh, joining us to our um, last topic on this series of june <laughs> hope you guys are enjoy and thank you for our speaker our exp uh, expert peter from sequoia and also gary from vertex hope you guys are doing well and hopefully we can um meet here in block 71 jakarta or maybe in another uh, you know session and yeah also thanks for our moderator uh, widya sukarta to lead the session <laughs> Uh, and guys, we are going to take a picture together. So just uh, please to, uh, yeah, stand by smiling. Yeah. Great. And our colleagues will <laughs> will help to. Uh, is Dia uh, Nabila? Dia also uh, can if you want to turn on the video, please. And our colleagues <laughs> will help to yeah just uh, stand by for smiling. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. One, two, three.
Oke, okay. alright guys, so thank you so much once again. Uh, I hope you guys are doing safe and sound, uh, and also hopefully this pandemic uh, and this COVID situation will pass it as soon as possible, and we are going to uh, see you and meet you here in Blok Samantha Jakarta or uh, in any other uh, event and program. Yeah. yeah. So sorry uh, for any mistaken or technical issue or etc. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if we have any, also the question. Thank you for all the question uh, and for all the attendees. Uh, have a good day and see you. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. You. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Vidya. Yeah, thank, thank you, Hannah. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.